This is a thank you, because of you I can read, I am free to be. Everything I am, the strength you give, taught me to be brave, it is enough to save. My right to learn, to write and to fight. The war you waged brought us to the stage. A platform for the working voices, with your union you gave us choices. So much life, all because of you we stand. Because of your calloused hands, we'll keep standing, we'll keep demanding better, fairer justice. And all of this because of you. Everyone who gave a lifetime so I could claim what's mine. For everything that you decided to do, I will always be grateful for you. The second poem is called Music. Music of the working class in bands of brass, but it's also in laughter. Before you tell the story and after, the kind that can't be contained, that, the, that sound that is repeated refrain. It's also in family brawls and pub halls, and loud children in, from every house on the terrace street coming outside again to meet. With each other and make a mess, our music is the best. It's in whispers of mams talking to their bends and couples of chat without taking turns as we support, greet and celebrate so much music we create. In the music of being alive as well as fighting to survive, marching to the drum beat, moving feet, stories on repeat, brass bands, calloused hands, hear our words as we're going past. This is the music of the working class. That was written by herself, that is called The Miners. Do you know who I am? I am Beth, blonde hair, blue eyes, and I am going to see through the miners' eyes. The miners were stopped, and they needed conclusion. Losing their jobs is not the right solution. No jobs, no pay, nowhere to stay. Everybody needs some help. Because of this banner, because of the, this, the banners will rain as the beats clear. I am not just standing here for you to listen. Join me, please. Join me to protest this mission. The next poem that Bethel reads was an acrostic that we all wrote together on the first day that we started meeting up, and it's called Durham. Deep, dark, damp underground. We are unheard, not even a sound. Really, really long walks to work, to a place where all the rats are. Houses, our homes, a street only for we. Angry. All the accidents that put in our lives, angry are the minus ones. The work falling and pretending to be the men when illness strikes. So we strike money we needed to survive to keep our families alive. Exactly. 
example of who came before, because isn't that what it's all for? On the shoulders of northern lads and lasses, no rose-tinted glasses, it was grind and muck and labour. It was knowing your neighbour working side by side to provide for families, for home, for our own. The past we inherit and we give it respect. Those shoulders had so many people to protect. The future we build with children's palms. They have all the pieces tucked under their arms. The youth of today will lead tomorrow. From the Pitman strength we borrow. We are more than, we are northern. We are culture, we are all. We deserve to stand up tall. Unity is strength and we shall not forget. We'll march ever onwards without regret. We thank you for your calloused hands. It is on your shoulders that we stand. Thank you. So I'm going to do one final one, um, and then we'll do a, a quick bow and hello to all of them. Um, this one is generally about how proud we all are of our heritage, about northernness, about local identity. This is We Are Northern. I follow my feelings, I follow my feet. I'm taken to places beyond the concrete, to rivers and valleys, hill ranges to climb. I'd walk every inch if I was given the time. I walk while I question the place that I fit, and the tease water whispers truths I've yet to admit. I look out at everything from the window of this bus, at this region I love so much. But what do you think of us? How do you identify? I find when I try, I come up short, so I resort to the binary, the expected. But I have rejected that, now that I feel protected, and people have accepted everything it is that I am. Those people that know me, really know me, they show me a safe space, a place where cloudy days and hidden sun rays and galleries and natural trees are not too far apart. And at the heart, I love the heart and all the art that we can start to share. Through performance from pages which we take to the stages, both city and sea breeze, there is magic in time. We are Antiques. We are Northern. And we are more than Greg's bakers and Harlow makers, though we are just as proud of the crowd. Our foods can generate as we create another culinary masterpiece, which we release countrywide. We have pride in our many ways, and as we gaze around our home, we recognize we're not alone because we have each other, one another, a community, even more than. We are Northern. But what does that mean? What does that say? To be local? Let's be local. We speak as we find what's on our mind. Hard to be defined, we are kind to one another, to sister and brother, to father, mother, other. The rains, the river in our veins keeps our brains connected to human beings who may being here what it is. We have local business which gives fitness to our culture, our identity collective which I am oh so protective of. Our passions are massive, we are active and adaptive, we love loud, even louder than we're allowed because we're proud. We know how to live and how to forgive for doing what you needed to at the time because we do know a thing or two about struggle, about fighting silent wars, trying to break down doors, set to keep us outside, set to hide us away. But we have pride. We are the full rainbow and we don't intend to go quiet. Because look at us. We are brilliant, we are resilient, more than dialect remarks and landmarks. Though I love those two through and through. The bridges and buildings, we really are still things industrial yet rural. We live as plural, together, under every weather. We are forever northern. I fell in love with the commotion around the ocean of our coast, and I can boast all day about the view of the blue sky evening weaving through the trees. Feel delight as you reach the height at the top of Rosemary Topping before dropping down to visit the town in all its glory. Hear every story from our very northern people. I was born in the DL postcode, and I have owed much of who I am to that, this place I've chosen to be at. I've spent some years in DH2, and from those years on I knew that we are designed not to be outlined, we stay outside of the lines. Because we can create the ideas we generate are beautiful and bright, they light a fire to outshine us all. We are more than. We are northern. Thank you. Well, before you leave the stage, that was outstanding. All of you, fantastic. We're going to have some very important dignitaries taking over the stage and talking through the afternoon. But wow, you set the bar really high. How did that feel? Oh, okay, guys. Are you on back shift, by the way? I uh, thank you very much for making the effort. That's a brilliant outfit. And Lizzie and Rome, could I have a quick word just round one mic? 
what would these young people like to work with? I mean, just just a pleasure. I mean, Billy and the rest of my group worked so hard on what they were doing, and I think especially like you've had exams on recently, haven't you, Billy? You were in the middle of exams working on this poetry project as well. I was just like blown away. Fantastic, uh, Lizzie, for you as well. The Sacristan Youth Project. It's a special place, obviously. Oh, absolutely. They are a brilliant, brilliant group of young people. And they came in with so much energy. They were absolutely ready to go and write and read. Um, and there was one particular person who was very keen on writing because he knew everything about history, which I thought was a wonderful claim. And you two, keep doing what you do. It's absolutely brilliant. Once more, the future of Northeast culture, heritage, and our history of the future. Well done, Dan. Brilliant. Thank you. And before we move on to the, the big speeches uh, this afternoon, we have a trailer for that has been made by the brilliant Ken Loach. Ladies and gentlemen, who brought us the magnificent masterpieces, Cares, and so much in between, right up to I, Daniel Blake, and his collaborator, Paul Abney. Thank you very much for joining us. This is a real treat today. So just explain what we're going to see now, Ken. Uh, well, uh, great to be here, folks. Um, it's a trailer for the third film we made in the Northeast. It's called The Old Oak, and it's the struggle between two sides of our communities. The sides that welcomes refugees and makes them feel at home, and the few who take it, take it, take it really with a, um, who are not sure quite how to respond. Uh, it's called The Old Oak, set in a pub, and here's the trailer. How come they're getting all that stuff? We've lost everything. We've left in Warsaw. Did you take the photo there? No, I didn't take that photo. They're just kids, man. Let them get in the house and get set them, man. I'm really sorry that happened. I can't say I'm surprised at the other stuff that come out within the pump. This has become a dumping ground, lads. We've been in this village all of our lives. And we're supposed to share it with that lot. We don't even know them. Thank you for your kindness when we arrived. I really appreciate it. My name is Yara Minoy. What's yours? Told you a long time. Do you mind me asking? Are you alright? When I was a little girl, I wanted to be a photographer and travel the world. If you've got a moment, you'll come up a pub with me. I wanted to show you the photographs out here. Call me a life. She's gone forever. When you eat together, you stick together. Oh, they always said that. Some of the locals are struggling too. Everywhere's closed. Even the school's gone. We can't even look after our own. It's just one from back away, isn't it? Imagine if all the families mix and start to eat together. If you eat together, you stick together. Go on. Go on. Go on. The village. We need this. It's like a bloody refugee camp. What's your mother? It's not charity. This is solidarity. This is about we do something together. It takes a strength to build something new. It takes strength to build something beautiful. Do you know what sugar means? Yes, thank you. Sugar. Sugar. Yes, out this autumn, the old oak. We've got the filmmakers here, Paul and Ken. Fantastic, uh, tense subject matter, but really important. Still stories to be told from the northeast. Um, yes, definitely, Alfie, and a great pleasure to be here. And we really hope that our film will be about hope. But when we talk about hope, I think we have to remember some of its components and I hope you don't mind if I quote St. Augustine from 1500 years ago who said hope has two components, anger at the way things are and by God do we feel anger. The people we've met today are furious and angry about so many things but it doesn't have to be this way. So anger at the way things are and the courage to try and change them and that takes clear rigorous thinking and recognising where the enemy is. So it's a great pleasure to present this film to you, a great pleasure to be 
a small part in the 170th, 37th year of the DMA. A massive thank to the North East. And Ken, obviously, Merton, Easington, you'll see all those different places out here today, the East West Down Coalfields. They've got that powerful story to tell because they've been they've been punched about a bit, but they're still fighting back. Absolutely. I think what uh, the Durham Miners Gala brings is strength and solidarity. And when you see everyone walking together, you realize how strong we are. And the important thing is that we stick together. And uh, one thing we've noticed that Paul has said, walking behind the banners, I've never heard people so angry, really angry. And the Durham Miners Gala must stay at the forefront of our politics. This is not about nostalgia. This is about today's politics and the anger we all feel. And also, in that context, I'm really pleased to see Jeremy Corbyn is here and Jamie McJamie Jessel too. And we, when you see Jamie and Jeremy, we're in solidarity with them. Thank you very much. Hi, Ken Loach and hi, Paul Ari. Good luck in September. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Ken Loach and Paul Ari. The speeches probably will begin in about 10, 15 minutes time. Oh, Jeremy. Oh, Jeremy. Oh, Jeremy. Let's hope the weather stays fine and your journey's been good here. First of all, we've had a, a change this year. We've now got British Sign Language translators near, near to my left. As many of you will know, we've now got a trade union that leads towards the back of the field. And that's where you can visit your own trade unions or in the unlikely event that you're not in a trade union take up the opportunity and join today and likewise please join the friends of the Durham and Scala who are also situated in the trade union village in kick with our great tradition we open the gala with a civic address from mayor of durham and to that end 
I invite the right worshipful the Mayor of Durham to address you. Honoured guests, hello everyone, and welcome to this, the 137th Miners Gala. Words cannot express fully the emotion that I feel today. I'm greatly honoured to have the opportunity to play an active part in this historic event. I'm truly moved to see so many people here today. As Mayor of this wonderful city, I welcome you one and all. Whether you live in or around the city and travel from much further afield, welcome to the land of black gold, home. <laughs> to the black gold party, my fellow mayors and speakers, I extend a very warm welcome to the land of the Prince Bishops, which we all know so well is Durham. Many generations of Northeastern families have come over the years to the Miners Gala, where they make new friends and renew old acquaintances. This year should be no exception. Many people in County Durham come from mining families. I am no exception, with two great-grandfathers, seven great-granduncles and three granduncles, having been miners at both Mainsford and Chopwell Collieries. My father-in-law, grandfather-in-law and four great-grandfathers-in-law were all miners also. And I'd like to remember my good friend Janet's father, Ben Harbisher, who mined for 32 years at Spennymoor and Metal Bridge on what would have been his 91st birthday today. <laughs> to stand here, the great-granddaughter of a late miner and address the big meeting is an absolutely overwhelming honour. <laughs> After this speech, I'll have to leave you all to cut the local bands and banners to our magnificent cathedral for a fantastic service, which will witness the blessing of the banners. This year, Head and Lions, Coxhome, and Durham Aged Mine Workers Homes Association, which is marking their 125th anniversary, will have this honour. I hope that some of you will join me and support the dedicated musicians and followers who have come here to help us remember the commitment of all those people involved with the once traditional industry of coal mining here and throughout the world. Before I finish, I'd like to congratulate and thank the organisers of today's event for all their hard work. Well done. I bid you all a heartfelt welcome to Durham and hope you enjoy your day at this 137th Durham Miners Gala. I hope the tradition is kept going for many years to come, and I wish you all a safe journey home. Thank you. Thank you, lady mayor. An integral component of the Durham Miners Gala is the beautiful music of the brass band. It's customary, before we introduce the guest speakers, that the brass band...
watching the future itself, but I think what we just witnessed there is the future 40 or 50 years into the future, the Don Mine is gone. Comrades, without question, the big meeting is unique. A trade union gathering unrivaled in tradition and form. The big meeting's appeal is wider than ever, relevant to workers in every sector and the working class in general. The Durham Miners Gala attracts people from far beyond the North East. In fact, this weekend we've got guests from Spain, Italy, Germany and Poland who've joined us from Industrial in Europe representing over 7 million workers. Today is a day for trade unionists who share a desire to secure a better future for all. To that end, I want to pay particular tribute to every woman and man who withdrew their labour in the past 12 months. Thank you to every trade union representative who's done their utmost to protect workers' rights in the workplace. We know, just as the employees and the government, that it is organised labour that will ensure we succeed for our people. And that sense of collective solidarity is almost tangible today, and we must address them challenges in the future from this platform. As you know, we continue to operate in a legal framework designed to curtail trade union activities. A system created to prevent collective action by organised labour. Ballot thresholds, threats of minimum service levels are just two examples. And I, I have a personal frustration for recently when ballot thresholds were met, missed by the smallest of percentages. Those thresholds are not just frustrating, they're undemocratic. Workers, <laughs> workers being denied the chance to withdraw their labour simply because of an arbitrary government imposed hurdle. The introduction of minimum service levels will afford the government power to assert service levels for striking workers in certain public sectors will lead to sackings of union members and our unions being sued if the legislation is breached. Those sectors will just be the start of minimum service levels allowed under the statute book. Unions, our members, must work together across all sectors and advance a programme of non-compliance and resistance. Our history teaches us that power contains nothing without demand or struggle. And let's be clear, there's an opportunity here for a political party to step up to the plate and show support for workers ahead of the general election next year. <laughs> what we need is a democratic socialist party with socialism coursing through its veins, where its elected representatives will be encouraged to stand with workers in dispute and support along picket lines. Well, in the first hundred days of the general election, we demand the anti-trade union legislation is repealed, including the draconian ballot thresholds and the, uh, the minimum service levels are put in the dustbin. We expect full employment rights from day one and sectoral collective bargaining rights. We expect the introduction of electronic voting for trade union ballots. We demand an, in, an independent public inquiry into the events of June 1984 in Aldrich. <laughs> Pensions justice for mine workers, pension scheme members, and the WASPy women. <laughs> and let's not forget as we enter it 40 years since the miners' strike started, that'll be next year, we expect the government to cross the convictions of those sat and victimised miners in the <laughs> And on the 101st day after the general election, we'll have our utilities and transport back in public ownership for good measure. <laughs> Friends, We'll rid the NHS of the private sector, have a programme of building good quality social housing and a fully funded education system what our young people deserve.
comrades, the theme of the gala this year is Rise Up. And that's what we must do if we're to achieve our collective zenith of greater control for workers. The trade unions and guest speakers today will, I'm sure, inspire us to do just that. It's a privilege that I can introduce our first guest speaker. <clears throat> she became a member of our union when she started to work as a weekend assistant with Baker's Oven. She became a shop steward shortly after Greg's took over and became more active, not only in her own union, but in the wider trade union labour movement. Elected as a full-time officer in 2016, and she was elected as the first female general secretary of her union in 2019. <laughs> this woman's one of us, believe me. Please welcome Sarah Woolley, general secretary of the <laughs> Thank you for those kind words. It's an absolute honour and a privilege to be invited to speak at such an important event in our movement's calendar on behalf of the Bakers Food and Allied Workers Union. And it's great to see so many of our members here, both longer standing ones and absolutely brand new ones. And you're more than welcome in our union and I'm really looking forward to building your branch number 600 with you over the coming months and years. <laughs> to be here, letting the world know that trade unions are here, we are loud, and the bands have been absolutely on point today, haven't they? <laughs> we are proud, as you can see, from the fantastic display of banners, reminding us of our past and our present, and that we will continue to be the voice of working people and fight for our members and our class, regardless of what those down in Westminster try and do to us. I want to express solidarity from myself and on behalf of the BFADU to each and every one of you that are on dispute at the minute. You are absolutely amazing people. To those that thought it was over, dig deep. We are all with you, we're behind you and we stand absolutely in solidarity with you. You are not alone. You are all inspiring millions of other working people to demand better as well as showing how important it is not only to fight for your rights, your pain, your terms and conditions, but absolutely protect them for future generations too. The rising cost of living, friends, is crippling and killing people. We know our members working in the food industry were struggling to put food on the table back in 2021 when we surveyed them. And with the increase to energy costs, inflation, the impact of mortgages and rents, thanks to the increases of interest rates, not to mention the rising cost of food as well as everything else, working people are barely scraping by. It's absolutely disgusting that in the UK, the fifth richest country in the world, there are more food banks than Greg stores. We've just rerun our survey asking BFAW members about their experiences of accessing food during the cost of living crisis and produced a really hard hitting document, Food Workers on the Breadline. I really encourage you all to read it. We've been told that some members feel like their house is a prison. They stay at work longer so that they don't have to worry about putting the heating on. They don't invite people over anymore as they are ashamed as they have blankets all over the house to keep warm. The use of food banks, and this is people that are producing, delivering and selling food. The use of food banks of our members has increased by 10% in two years. It's absolutely disgraceful. These people are working hard, feeding the nation, and like many of you were championed as key workers during the pandemic, yet don't earn enough to survive. They are literally freezing and going hungry. And what are the Tories doing about this? Get them out. Instead of working with devolved nations and looking at how we get a right to decent, nutritious, affordable food for everyone, and I must stress, this means going further than offering free school meals, because whilst they agree and the campaign being run by the NEU is absolutely phenomenal, we've got members that are making sure that their kids have a dinner at tea time, but then are going and doing 12 hour shifts in a bakery of empty bellies. And what are the Tories doing about it? Instead of doing anything, they're looking at ways in which they can attempt to continue to try and break trade unions because everything they have tried so far hasn't worked. Well, 
everything that they continue to try will continue not to work. Because trade union parties aren't third party organisations, they are our members who are powerful when they come together collectively. Our members are the general public that they're trying to get on side and feeling so miserably to do so. But we can't rest on our laurels. We've got a lot of work to do, friends. We need to be talking to working people about trade unions because there's so many millions of working people who aren't members and many of them won't know or understand what a trade union is. We need to be removing the myths and lies peddled by the right-wing media that we're just greedy and talking to those who we don't necessarily agree with and at times probably don't really like about coming together, standing shoulder to shoulder, how that makes us strong, how that makes us powerful and how that enacts change because this is vital to regrowing our movement. We have to take over the spaces that the right wing are trying to wedge into and push them out. Because let's be clear, they are absolutely no friends of working people. They just seek to divide us so the rich can continue as normal. And initiatives like Organise Now are helping with this. Have a look at the website, sign up to be a volunteer and join the 180 plus reps that are supporting hundreds of workers organise their workplace. People who wouldn't have thought about being in a trade union beforehand have now dipped their toe into the movement thanks to Organise Now and I'm incredibly chuffed that our union was the first union to get behind the project and I know as left are on board now as well. But friends, we can't stop there. Everybody needs to go away today and there's an awful lot of you so we expect to see change on the back of this. Everyone needs to go away and talk to your friends, your neighbours, your colleagues, your kids, your grandchildren about trade unions. Tell them that we're not a third party organisation like an insurance company that swoops in to save the day. That it's not general secretaries like me that are the trade union, but them, their mates, their work colleagues, their neighbours and their communities that make our trade union movement great. And that change happens when we are organised and stand together collectively, workplace by workplace, community by community. We can't rely on anybody else to do it for us. We have to do it ourselves. But that's only going to happen if we work together, truly work together across the movement throughout our class. It's absolutely great to be here. I can stop pinching myself now that, it's, that somebody was going to tell me it was a mistake and I was the wrong person. But I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Solidarity. <laughs> And as, uh, our next speaker is president of our union, leading their, <laughs> leading their industrial action campaign over the cost of living crisis alongside the General Secretary, Mark Sawaka. <laughs> Resulting in hundreds of days of strike action over the last eight months, some in Durham, where our joint Fran and our comrades from PCS. <clears throat> She's a long-standing supporter of the Durham Miners Gala. She encourages all new and young PC activists, many of them are here today, to attend and participate in one of the most significant events in the trade union calendar. Please give a warm welcome to the president of PCS, Fran Heathcote. what a massive honour and a privilege it is to be speaking at this year's big meeting. Every single government since Thatcher has waged a, waged a sustained attack on workers' living standards through cuts and privatisation. Every government has treated the union movement at best as a problem and at worst as the enemy within. Why? Because they know that the organised working class is the only force in society capable of defeating their policies. We have seen levels of poverty not witnessed since Victorian times. We meet after a year in which the working class has found its voice again. The current strike wave has been the longest and the most intense since the 1980s. And it's no wonder we have had double digit inflation for over a year now. It's becoming normalised. The impact is horrendous. Millions have been plunged, plunged into poverty and misery. Lives have been ruined. 
children's futures are being destroyed. If we want images of what life is like in 21st century Britain, then here's one for you. Supermarkets are now putting tags on some of the products because of an increase in shoplifting. But which products am I talking about? Champagne? Luxury goods? No. Baby milk powder and nappies, now wrapped in security tags and kept behind locked plastic screens. How is that acceptable? When did such barbarism become acceptable? When did it become acceptable that people had to queue at food banks? That people had to work two, three and even four jobs just to get by? When did it become acceptable that people have to choose between eating and eating? And when did it become acceptable that people can't afford to do either? None of this is an accident. It is not a result of incompetence or simply greed. It is not just because the Tories and the ruling class are nasty people. They may be. But the reality is that this is a deliberate policy of this government to take back every single gain that our class secured over generations of struggle and sacrifice. determined to dismantle the welfare state and the NHS, the two pillars upon which the working class has managed to gain a degree of security in an inherently unstable system. They are intent on a system in which profit comes first, and one in which people don't just come second, they don't count at all. And they lie to us, don't they? Inflation is not driven by rising wages, it is driven by excessive profiteering. Yeah. their public services literally from cradle to grave and the Tories have always hated being forced to give concessions to working people whether that be benefits, health care, access to justice, health and safety, education and all the other services that our members and those in other unions provide and that is why for over 40 years they have cut and they have privatised. Holding down public sector wages is not because there is no money. In fact, the profits are rolling in. Wages have been held down and conditions have been slashed as part of a deliberate strategy. Their aim is to demoralise public sector workers and to deny all workers access to the services which they need and deserve. And the truth is that the Tories and the profiteers don't really give a damn whether or not doctors and nurses leave the National Health Service. They don't care if public sector workers feel undervalued and unsupported. They don't care if we feel demoralised and let down. That is their intention. And that, along with starving public services of investment, is how they set us up for failure. And then they tell us that public services are failing and that the only solution is privatisation. They want us all on temporary contracts, scrambling for work. They want us broken and begging. They want the so-called gig economy to become the norm in every sector, every service and in every industry. They will not stop these attacks because of the suffering that they cause. These attacks have to be stopped. We are not all in this together. These people, the exploiters, the profiteers, the government, their friends in the media, are not our partners. We do not share common interests with these people and we never will. They are our class enemies. And we have to look at ourselves as well because if there's one thing you can say about the Tories whatever differences they have they certainly unite and stick together when it comes to attacking us and meanwhile many of us have fought isolated struggles being picked off one by one and fighting alone means that we often have to settle for less than we can achieve collectively in 1984 and 85 the miners were defeated because the enormous working class solidarity that existed was not translated into solidarity action. That defeat, that defeat was followed by a wave of reaction that saw mass cuts, privatisation, anti-union legislation, unrestrained greed and the destruction of whole communities. And don't we know that up here? In 2011, the one-day public sector pensions general strike to halt the tax on our pensions was betrayed. The sellout resulted in more than a decade of austerity. When we are divided, we are weakened. 
I mean, everybody bears the consequences of that, not just striking workers. The Tories have sought to scapegoat and to demonise refugees for society's problems. And that is why we have to organise against the far right and against the racists. <laughs> My union, PCS, played a key role in stopping the Rwanda deportations. <laughs> we're, we're so proud of that. We defeated the Tories on the hateful small boats policy because we know but our enemies are not refugees in small boats in the English Channel. They are in Downing Street, in Parliament, in <laughs> One of the Tories' greatest achievements has been to deny us the right to effective political representation through the party that the trade union movement itself created, and that's the Labour Party. The Tories achieved that through the creation of New Labour. And when Jeremy Corbyn won the leadership of the Labour Party, <laughs> they launched a campaign of political assassination to silence the millions of us who wanted an end to that corrupt rule. And they are determined to divide us. So our response to that has to be solidarity. <laughs> I desperately want to see an end to this Tory government. But now that the Labour Party is once again under the control of people that the ruling class approves of, we cannot pretend that if they win the next general election, all of our problems are going to be over. But on the contrary, if Starmer or any Labour MP is not prepared to stand on a picket line today, they will not be our friends in government. they will govern in their interests and not in ours. If Labour MPs are accepting money from company, companies sizing up the NHS for further privatisation, they are already bought off. And any union leader that thinks they can have a cosy relationship with any government, even a Labour government, that is committed to cuts and privatisation is in for a very rude awakening. We are now in a period of deepening crisis and the profiteers are giving no concessions. We cannot look at the politicians to come to our rescue. We have to organise now to defend our members and our class. The recent strike wave has proved not only that resistance is possible, but that it's an absolute necessity. If we're truly going to win what we deserve, we have to unite not just in words, we have to unite in action. The attacks that public sector workers face all come from one source, and that's this government. If we're going to defeat them, we too have to fight collectively. We must campaign together, and we must strike together. And every worker who has taken strike action in the last year knows that we have to maximise the enormous potential strength of our movement in order to resist and fight back. There are core demands that we can act together over. No cuts, no privatisation, no further outsourcing. Bring all the major utilities back into public ownership and defend the NHS. And on that last point about the NHS, that is not the job of the health unions alone. It is the job of every union, every community, every worker, and everybody who wants decent society for future generations. If we cannot unite to defend our most important assets, won over generations of struggle, the NHS and the welfare state, then we must ask ourselves, what exactly are we for? If we don't work, campaign and strike collectively, then those attacks are going to continue. The race to the bottom will continue. The cuts and the privatisation will continue. We have repeatedly been told by some that there is no alternative. But there is an alternative, and that alternative is all about solidarity. We have to build solidarity and resistance in every workplace and community. But also, we need to stop muttering about what we believe in, in quiet voices, 
and say it out loud. Say it very loud. Be proud of it. We want an end not just to this rotten Tory government, but an end to their rotten pluck up this system. We want a society without greed, without climate catastrophe and without war. We want a society in which people come before profit, a society where people matter. We want a socialist society. In solidarity, thank you. Point Fran Mayfair was not only must we organise in the workplace but in the community. Now, our next guest speaker is a community organiser for the Tyne and Weir citizens. Born and raised in the West End of Newcastle and studied at the London School of Economics. Her passions are tackling structural inequality, championing children's rights, bringing about positive social change. She's worked with children and young people and she will have views and lived experiences in form policy, practice and research on a regional and national basis. Citizens UK organises communities to act together for power, social justice and the common good. Please give a warm welcome to Sarah Bryson. Yeah, yeah, Fran, what a brilliant speech. But it doesn't have to be this way. We take great hope from the DMA who've refused to accept poverty wages in our region since 1869. What a tradition we have. We stand on the shoulders of giants. I want to talk to you about Kia. Kia Hardy. Looking at the sea of beautiful banners today, lovingly crafted, I couldn't help but wonder what would happen if Kia Hardy flew down from one of those banners today and stood on this stage? What would he say to us now? Imagine him stood here like he did in 1905. Would he accept rising poverty in our region? Would he accept families working hard but unable to afford food heating and decent housing? Would he accept politicians who claim to represent the working class but refuse to support industrial action? Even refusing to give all children a free school meal? Would this man who started work at the age of seven, what would he think as he looked at our region where we now have 47% of all our under fives living in poverty? His eyes would pop at the number of food banks, bed banks, and the cruelty of those who have to choose between heat and food. But he would also say, it doesn't have to be this way. There are real people, real people who sit behind these horrendous figures. People like me. I would have been one of those statistics. A child on a council estate on free school meals, with hard-working parents struggling to make ends meet. It has an impact on our health, our height, our children's heights are starting to decline again, and our chances of being poor as an adult, our life chances and opportunities, and even how long we live for. Keir Hardy faced the crisis of political representation. We too have got an elephant in our sitting room. If we can't get our hands on the levers of political power, the grand projects of our time like the NHS will not survive the privatizers who are not limited to one political party. The crisis in political representation is an existential threat to democracy itself. Mind the gap. If we don't mend the gap between the needs of the majority and its lack of political representation, then the hard right will fill that vacuum with fear, hatred and empty promises. History warns us where that might lead. 
Keir Hardy formed the independent Labour Party in 1893 to be a true voice for working class people in Parliament. He organised because what existed wasn't working. Because he saw Lib Lab MPs voting against motions to implement the eight hour working day. So what do we do now? Genuine radical representation will always be a battlefield because those with the power and the wealth just follow the money. Look at who is giving donations to our MPs of all political parties. They will always try and undermine it. So we can't wait for MPs to do the right thing. Across the region, Tyne and Weir citizens are organising in our communities, in our churches, our mosques, our synagogues, our schools and universities, our trade union branches and community groups. We've been organising and campaigning for a real living wage. We've won campaigns at Sunderland Uni, Newcastle Uni, Sunderland and Newcastle Council, and have launched Sunderland and Newcastle as living wage cities. <laughs> But Durham, Durham, you've got work to do. We're currently organising to ensure Durham University and Durham County Council cannot continue to pay poverty wages. In North Shields, six form students have been organising to reduce bus fares. They've taken action and they've won. Young people in Durham have been organising to keep their change from their free school meals. If they're absent from school or they don't spend their full allowance, they were asking a simple question, where does the change go? I'll tell you where it went. It went to the profit makers and they kept that on a daily basis. 88 million pound lost each year from free school meals stolen from our poorest children. Did young people in Durham accept this? No, they organized. And in one school, in one year, they got 17,000 pound back to children on free school meals. We're also organising to welcome refugees. The North East has always been a welcoming place. We continue that tradition with community sponsorship schemes right across our region. Because when we organise in large numbers like we have here today, we have power. We get the justice, we have the power to compel. Winning the moral argument is not enough. We must organise in large numbers and take action if we're to win. Shakespeare wrote, there is a tide in the affairs of men, which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. Omitted, all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and miseries. It's time to ride with the tide, comrades. No one is coming to save us. No one is coming to do it for us. We must organize trade unions and communities together. Old Keir Hardy would be spinning in his grave. Let's cheer him up from the gala. Let's say it together as the giants of our past always have done. It doesn't have to be this way. Let's hear you. One more time, but a bit louder. Solidarity. Thanks very much, Sarah. And I'll give you a commitment on behalf of the Durham Miners that we'll work with you in Durham to deliver them improvements. Our, ne our next speaker has been, active in the, been an active trade unionist and campaigner throughout his working life. Joining his first union whilst working part time in ASDA, age 17. He's worked in call centres, employed as a, a hotel night porter. And, and many of his roles have been temporary or with the agency contracts. He was a member of the first intake of the TUC's organising academy in 1998 and in 2000 joined the TU's, TUC staff, rising to regional secretary in this region and subsequently head of organising. In 2013 he was appointed TUC assistant general secretary and in 2006, sorry, in 2017, appointed as TUC General Secretary, and in 2016, Deputy General Secretary. <clears throat> He's led the campaign to defend the public sector pensions and oppose regional pay. And during the pandemic, 
He led union efforts to improve the government's safe working guidance with significant success. He's got a long employment history, believe me. Please welcome Paul Novak, General Secretary of the TNC. Well, Stephen, sisters and brothers, it is a huge honour for me to address the big meeting for the first time as General Secretary, to bring greetings and solidarity on behalf of the TUC, our 48 unions, five and a half million members, a movement of and for working class people. And I want to start by sending a message to every dodgy employer, every right wing politician, every right wing commentator that's written off the trade union movement, that's denigrated the trade union movement, that's attacked the trade union movement. Our movement is fighting, our movement is winning, and our movement, brothers and sisters, is back. <laughs> Since I took over as General Secretary six months ago, I've had the privilege of standing on dozens of picket lines with thousands of workers taking industrial action, sometimes for the very first time. Railway workers, teachers, posties, lecturers, civil servants, dockers, factory workers, bus drivers, paramedics, physios, and many, many more, including those incredible Amazon workers in Coventry. And I, and I want to say this to every single one of those workers who's taken action, voted for action, is voting for action now, considering action. Your fight is our fight. When you win, we all win. Solidarity, comrades, solidarity. And look, that solidarity extends to all workers. Here in the UK, around the globe, and yes, to those who come to our country to build new lives for themselves and their families. I am the proud grandson of migrants to this country. Men who came to Liverpool, one from Poland, one from Hong Kong during the Second World War. They both played their part in the fight against fascism. They both met Liverpool Irish women and they stayed in this country to raise their families. And so to me, this is personal. Our movement stands with all workers. Wherever they were born, whatever their nationality, whatever their religion, whatever their race. And instead, instead we have the spectacle of the government's shameful, divisive, illegal migration uh, bill. We've got a Tory migration minister, immigration minister, ordering, up, ordering them, covering up the painting over of cartoon murals in an asylum centre for displaced refugee children. That's who we are dealing with. And I think we should be clear from this gala. Our country should never should never ever turn its back on those fleeing poverty, persecution and war. Never turn our back. <laughs> Solidarity. Solidarity has never been more important than it is right now in the middle of the most extreme cost of living crisis in over two centuries with pay packets lagging far behind bills, rents and mortgages. But let me make this one point brothers and sisters. Not everybody is living through a cost of living crisis. Not everybody is feeling the pinch because Britain, Tory Britain, is a country of grotesque extremes. We've got bankers bonuses at record levels, corporate profits soaring, top bosses pay and dividends outstrapping wages each and every year. That's not happened by accident. It's what happens when you've got a government of the rich, for the rich, a cabinet of millionaires that doesn't care if our wages stagnate, that doesn't care that one in seven people are skipping meals because they literally can't afford to put food on the table, and doesn't care if tens of thousands of families can't pay their bills. Well, we care. Do we care, Gala? Yeah. And we are going to fight for our class and fight for our communities and we're going to win for our class and our communities. And our unions are winning for their members, negotiating inflation-proof pay deals, winning union recognition, forcing ministers uh, back to the bargaining table. And it's because we've been fighting. 
And it's because we've been willing that this government is attacking our right to strike. Their minimum services level bill will take away the right to strike from one in five workers in this country. It will mean you can vote in a lawful industrial action ballot, go through all the hurdles, all the barriers. Your employer can tell you you have to go to work and cross your own picket line. And if you don't, you could be sacked. It is a shameful, unjust, unworkable piece of legislation. Now, if the Tories force this legislation onto the statute books, we'll challenge it in the courts. We'll hold Labour to its commitment to repeal that legislation within the first 100 days of a Labour government. But more importantly, whatever the Tories' law might say, we will defend and fight for any nurse, any teacher, any firefighter who loses their job because of these new laws. We will fight like hell to defend the right to strike and we'll fight like hell to defend any worker who exercises that right to strike. Sisters and brothers, we need to make sure the Tories pay the political price for their attacks on working people and their attacks on unions. We need political change and we need a government that will deliver the priorities of unions and their members and everyone here today at this gala. That means a new deal for working people with day one employment rights, a ban on zero hours contracts, a ban on firing we hire so we never again have a p in this country, new sectoral fair pay agreements to drive up standards in sectors like social care and a repeal of the anti-union legislation. <laughs> And brothers, sisters, we need to be ambitious. 75 years ago, Nye Bevan spoke to this gala in the week that the post-war Labour government, a government dealing with the aftermath of the Second World War, introduced the National Health Service. And so it is right that we demand a Labour government is equally ambitious. We need to rebuild and invest in our schools, our hospitals, our infrastructure. We need to deliver a decent pay rise for all public sector workers. And we need to deliver at the end of the disaster that's been rail privatisation, water privatisation, energy privatisation. <laughs> and let's, let's have an honest conversation about tax and who pays tax in this country. Because it is crazy that our Prime Minister, who is with hundreds of millions of pounds pays tax at the same effective rate as a teacher. So to the banks, the energy companies, the technology giants that have made huge profits, to the city bankers, the captains of industry and the hedge fund bosses, to the super rich hiding away in their tax havens, I say this, it's time to pay your fair share. Let's tax the wealth, let's tax the wealthy, not working people. Now, brothers and sisters, let me finish on this point. And all the speakers have made this point. It's really important. If we are going to win political change, if we're going to defend the right to strike, if we're going to raise wages, if we're going to rebuild our public services, we are going to have to build a movement that can fight for and win change. Not a movement that fights the good fight and falls short. Not a movement that's content with glorious defeats. A movement that can fight and win for all workers in all of our magnificent diversity. <laughs> Black and white, men and women, young and old, LGBT plus and straight, we are stronger together. So let's stick together, organise together, fight together. That's where we win together, comrades. Solidarity. <laughs> Welcome back to the North East. Our next guest speaker, it's always a privilege to introduce this chap. A former miner, William Mill Colliery from 1977, for 30 years until it closed in 1993. He was out of his union from 79 and he joined the Lodge Committee, rising to his General Secretary in 1985. Like myself, he served on the Durham Miners National Area Executive and addressed the National Conference on numerous occasions especially during the, the Durham Miners in 2019 
and is responsible for ensuring the high provision, provision of high quality advice, support and representation in our mining communities. As one of our own, please welcome Alan Marjum. Thanks, Chairman. I try and live up to the marvellous introduction. I'd like to express, and there's been a lot said today, I'd like to express about solidarity with other workers. I'll tell you where I stand. I stand shoulder to shoulder with every worker in this field. I can When they're standing up to protect public services, to fight against job losses and continued attacks on living standards, I see it as them and us. Them being the Tories and the capitalist class and us, the working class. And I'm not no apology whatsoever for standing shoulder to shoulder with teachers and firefighters and public sector workers, anybody, any workers, the real workers, I'll stand shoulder to shoulder before I will tolerate a Tory. And I'll tell him his stance, I'll tell him his stance on the Labour leader, the Labour Party leader's position on picket lines, where he's disenfranchised MPs for having the audacity to stand on picket lines, standing shoulder to shoulder with the aforesaid workers in struggle. Stop, stop, an absolute no, disgrace. Yeah. It's an absolute disgrace. And by the way, as per our constitution, he was invited again this year to come to the gala, not to speak, but as a guest, but he had a, he had a previous engagement and couldn't come. I've heard that before. we heard that with Blair for 10 years. So I'm going to tell him, Keir Starmer, the next Durham Miners Gala is on Saturday, July the 13th, 2024. I want to talk about solidarity. It's not only with other trade unions and trade unionists and our communities. Tell you another position that I'm going to take and have done for a long time. I stand shoulder to shoulder with Jeremy Corbyn. Teachers, and by the way, any of you had a strike, two strikes this week, the latest one being yesterday. Daniel, we stand in solidarity with you, Tommy. We see the National Health Service being under constant attack, which has already been mentioned, but I'm going to mention it again. We need to stand and fight. If we're not prepared to stand and fight for the National Health Service, what the hell are we prepared to stand and fight for? It's a very dear and civilization. And I want to quote or paraphrase Nye Bevan, the near great Nye Bevan, who, when referring to the Tories, said that they were lower than vermin. I totally agree with that. <laughs> the need to fight. Needs to go on. And as the late great Bob Crow said, if you fight, you'll not always win. But if you don't fight, you'll always lose. Yeah. Two, two. <laughs> the fight goes on. 
As far as we're concerned, I'm a proud member of the National Union of Mine Workers. I'm also a member of the GNB. I'm a proud member of the NUM. Although we did get beat in 1984-85, the NUM refused to walk away and to hide away. And this is the result of that. We closed our pit. We tried to crush our spirit. We damaged our communities, in some cases, almost beyond repair. But we'll never, ever, ever dampen our spirits. And this gala is a timely reminder to those in the Tory party and elsewhere who attempt to destroy us. But we're here, we don't go anywhere, and we'll continue to fight for justice. Woo! We've got, we've got a fight going on also for justice for our group. For 1984, June 18, 1984, nobody been held to account for the violent attacks perpetrated by the state, by the police, on defenceless minors, with men, women, and children. Somebody needs to be held accountable for that. And I'm imploring, in fact, I'm demanding that the next Labour government address that travesty of justice. The fight goes on also to address the anomaly of the mine workers' pension scheme. Now, the National Union of Mine Workers have had two leading opinions on the agreement that was reached in 1994, whereby the government take half the actuarial surplus. They've had over four and a half billion pounds to date in our money. It's a legal agreement that can only be changed by political will. Again, we're telling the Labour Party, when you come into power, you redress that balance. Why should we say miners when it's on the party line and government get them from the four million pounds and our money? We've got to talk about we want to talk about fuel poverty and I extend warm greetings to our friends from Unite who are leading the campaign, the fuel poverty campaign. It's an absolute disgrace that we've got millions of people living in poverty, trying to afford to put the heat in, uh, heating on, and it's again, as has been mentioned, we've got a choice between heating and eating. It's an absolute disgrace in the fifth richest economy in the world. We've got the waspy women, I mentioned this last year. We've got the waspy women, women born in the 50s, who were denied six years of pension payment. We want that restoring and compensation paid. Again, it requires a political will to do that. That's another demand for the next Labour government. And finally, comrades, I'll just say it's a massive privilege to be able to stand here and represent a great organisation like the Durham Miners Association and the National Union of Mine Workers. And I'd implore anybody who's not in a union, I think I'm speaking of a converted, for anybody who's not in a union, get over and visit the, the Marquis and join a union today. Solidarity and strength, thanks very much. You're always guaranteed a passionate speech from our margin. Comrades, we've got our final speaker today. She, she's a member of parliament for Coventry South, elected in December 2019. Proud champion of socialist politics from parliament to the picket line. She stands side by side, shoulder to shoulder, with striking workers speaks out against racism and bigotry and is determinedly represents our diverse working class communities. Please give a warm Durham Miners welcome to Zara Sultana. Sultana, I'm the Labour Member of Parliament for Country South and it is the honour 
out of my elected life so far to be with you today to speak at the great big meeting. I actually came in 2019 and I was part of the Unite delegation and I was standing out there getting soaked and it's just a privilege to be on this side and to see you guys not getting soaked, so thank you so much. I've been really nervous about this speech, it's my biggest speech Don't since my maiden speech. And the reason why I was nervous about my maiden speech in the Commons is because it's not built for people like us. It's a place that is incredibly intimidating, um, if you let it be intimidating. I'm sat across MPs who have waged war on our communities. And today I find myself nervous but for the opposite reason. I'm here in front of the most beautiful crowd I've ever spoken in front of. And friends and comrades. So I want to thank Alan and the Durham Miners Association for inviting me to speak and to thank my good friend Mary Kelly Foy for allowing me to be in her constituency, the second best constituency in the country after Coventry South. Since the Gala last met, food prices, food prices have rocketed, the cost of fuel and energy is through the roof, mortgage payments and rent are going up and up. Everything is soaring except pay. Now, we call it a cost of living crisis, but this is a crisis for our class, not theirs. For them, record profits, record wealth for the billionaires, and record inequality. So let's be clear, this isn't a crisis because there isn't enough wealth. It's a crisis because they are hoarding all the wealth. <laughs> wage price inflation it's greed inflation it's as simple as that it's inflation not driven by workers wages but by corporate greed so the next time they call for pay restraints or the next time we see Tory ministers hitting out at greedy workers fighting for better pay let's ask the question why aren't they calling for profit restraints let's ask the question why won't they condemn CEOs for taking record pay packages let's ask the question why aren't they complaining about companies handing out millions of pounds in dividend deals? And let's ask why it's always workers who have to make the sacrifices while the rich get richer. Those are the questions we need to be asking. This year's gala is obviously dedicated to the incredible workers. that access to healthcare shouldn't depend on wealth, that everyone, no matter their class, no matter their race, no matter their nationality, every one of us should be cared for. And this universal, and this universal comprehensive healthcare service was there to deliver that publicly owned and paid for, free at the point of use, an oasis of socialism in a desert of capitalism. It's what people fought for. It's what socialists, trade unionists, working class, and men and women fought for. It's what a Labour government proudly built. 
is our proudest achievement and today that victory is under threat like never before. Once ranked the best healthcare system in the world, today is fragmented, underfunded and privatised by stealth and it is on its knees, we all know that, and they smell blood. They call for reform, the code word for privatisation. To stand where the great night Bevan once stood, I make a pledge to you, so long as I'm a member of parliament, I will fight for our NHS to be restored. I will fight for us to end all forms of privatisation, for us to secure funding and to give staff the pay rights they deserve because clapping never pays the bills. And we can't stop there. Our NHS is loved because it demonstrates a different way of doing things. It shows what we can do when we take a service out of the market and run it for the public good. So I don't think we should just be defending that model, we need to extend it. I don't just want a national health service, I want a national care service, I want a national education service. And my God, I want rail, mail, energy in our public utilities, and water back in public ownership. legislation repealed. I want to live in a society where not a single person goes hungry at night or is homeless, where everyone's needs are met. And the rich and powerful ask the question, how will these radical demands they call them, how will they be paid for? Well, here's my answer. They're going to pay for it. We're going to tax the rich. To pay for it. There's an old name for that new caring society. And it's a name that has inspired past generations. It's inspired on these beautiful banners that will proudly carry through the city today. And again, probably not very fashionable in my party at the moment, but that name is socialism. Yeah! Yeah! And as someone who believes that politicians should be a signpost, not a weather vane, I'm still very proud to call myself a socialist and always will be. Yeah! strive to build. So as we look towards that future, I want to conclude with these words, and I said them in the very first speech I gave you in Parliament. I want to say them again this time, not surrounded by political enemies, but surrounded by friends. This time, not a pledge to myself, but as a promise we made to every single one of us, to each other and to our comrades. Ten years ago I was a teenager, I'm getting old, so help me out. I was a student and I never dreamed I'd be here today. But in 10 years time, I want to look young people in the eye and say with pride that my generation faced 40 years of neoliberalism and we ended it. We faced rising racism and we defeated it. We faced the planet in peril and we saved it. We have our work cut out, but together we can do it. Thank you and solidarity. <laughs> Show their solidarity before you walk away, lads. Thank you for what you've just done. Got some great t shirts. The vast majority of the audience today have shown their utmost respect and solidarity to the guest speakers. We've had one or two moves trying to shut people down, but it just demonstrates that true unity is sticking together and sort that bother out as well. Well done, lads. I wish you all a safe and pleasant journey home. <laughs>
Duke's thanks must go to the staff of the Durham Miners Association and our friends of the Durham Miners Gala. Plus our trade union colleagues who meet monthly at fundraise and discuss the organising of the event. Thanks to all the banner groups, brass bands, trade unions, communities and our guest speakers who have made their presence felt today. I've just been passed a note actually um, and I wish I'd had this early because the, the various media outlets I've been interviewed by the are asking is why is the gala still relevant? The pits were shut 30 years ago. Why are you here? Oh, oh. You guys are better than me to answer that. Well, let us tell you, 63 banners march through the cobbled streets of Durham City today. Supported by 54 brass bands. Those numbers, coupled with what I'm witnessing from here, demonstrates to me this event's bigger, better, and alive for the future. And this is how I'm going to conclude. I sincerely thank you all for coming. You've been a fantastic audience, as the guy always is. Have a safe journey home, grab a pint or four, and uh, as I say, if you're not a friend of the Durham Miners Gala yet, please join up. You can then see you next year when you come at your R8 Mara. Gun Canny!